Hi, I'm Bear Kennedy. Um, today I'll talk to you about Pigeon for Risk V, which is a fast and productive instructor simulator. This work was done in collaboration with uh, Derek Lockhart, who's now at Google, and Christopher Benn. So let's look at the computational stack, and it has uh, software and hardware as usual, and instruction set architecture such as Risk V provides the interface between the two. Uh, if you want to functionally model your hardware, you need an instruction set simulator. One of the main goals of an instruction set simulator is performance, and a high-performance instruction set simulator is important because it enables to, you to run real-world benchmarks in reasonable time. To give you a feel of what's out there, the simplest instruction set simulators uh, are interpretive simulators, which fetch, decode, and execute every single instruction. Um, and they typically get 1 to 10 MIPS, millions of instructions per second. And for real-world benchmarks that you might find a spec, this would mean many days of simulation time. A much more sophisticated uh, technique is DBT, dynamic binary translation. And dynamic binary translation basically dynamically translates uh, ta target instructions into host instructions, therefore amortizing the fetch and decode overhead for many of these target instructions. And these typically get hundreds of MIPS, or reducing the simulation time to only a couple of hours. Uh, one of the best in class DBT out there is QMU, and it can get up to 1,000 MIPS, maybe even more. So on, on the contrary, the other aspect of instruction set similar is productivity, and uh, namely productively developing support for new ISAs, productively extending existing ISAs for instruction set sp uh, specialization, and productively adding custom instrumentation so that you can quantify the benefits of these instruction set sp uh, specializations. And we, there is definitely a trade-off between, between the two. There's a tension between uh, productivity and performance for these simulators. Most uh, high-performance uh, instruction set simulators, such as QMU, are notoriously known to be uh, not very productive, and vice versa. Uh, depending on who's using the instruction set simulator, they might not care about every single aspect of productivity and performance. For instance, uh, proprietary ISAs tend to be released by a single vendor, single ISA specification in the hopes of satisfying all the users' needs. So those users might not care too much about uh, productively extending this ISA because it's not really a common thing. However, RISC-5 is quite different because it's, uh, it's designed with extensions in mind, and in, in fact, it encourages the users to do so, such. So users will likely want to specialize their ISA for their own needs, and they will likely want their instructions as simulator to be productively extensible, productively instrumentable. So we believe that the uh, risk five community in particular would like to, like to have an instruction scenario that is both productive and high performance. So we, we believe Pigeon is the right tool for this. So this, this uh, tension between productive and performance is nothing new among these simulators. Uh, the traditional way to achieve productivity is to use high-level architecture and description languages. The traditional way to get high performance is to use low-level languages such as C and write these notorious dynamic variant translations. There has been some work to automatically translate these high-level descriptions into low-level C. Um, however, these usually suffer because they're either proprietary tools themselves or because they're not very well maintained. Um, there's another very similar trend going on um, in, the, in the programming languages community. So uh, dynamic languages such as JavaScript and Python tends to have interpreters, just-in-time enabled interpreters, they're also traditionally written in C. However, a notable exception of this is the PyPy project. Instead of using low-level C to write their interpreter, they actually wrote the interpreter in Python itself. Rather, it's a reduced subset of Python called RPython. So they, uh, this, the difference between RPython and py, uh, Python uh, mostly is the, this, the fact that RPython is, uh, you, you can do type inference over that. In addition, they also developed a translation toolchain called RPython Translation Toolchain, which automatically translates this RPython source into C and compiles that. In addition, it also gives you a just-in-time compiler, pretty much for free. So our observation is that we could use the same fr framework, this RPython Translation Toolchain, uh, to write our interpreter uh, pigeon in RPython Reduce Python, translate this automatically, and get also benefits of the jitting. Uh, for the purpose of this talk, DBT and JIT, I'll use those two terms uh, interchangeably. They mean roughly the same end result for, in this context. So uh, when you want to write your uh, architecture, your ISA, for instance, RISC-V, the first thing you'll touch is the architecture description language. So I'll give you a feel of what the code looks like, uh, in particular to RISC-V implementation with it. 
It has three aspects of it. You need to, the, the architectural state is encoded, the in, uh, instruction encodings, and instruction semantics. So architectural state uses just a Python class, as you can see like that, and just, just like the usual things such as your program counter, register file, memory. Uh, it can also include things like your uh, optional floating point state if you're enabling floating point, or it could also include statistic related things such as number of instructions. Instruction encoding, Pigeon uses uh, an encoding table like this, basically the name of the instruction and a bit mask, which determines if it's a hit or not. Using these descriptions, the Pigeon framework automatically translates this to a decoding table. And finally, the instruction semantics look like the following. These are basically the pure uh, Python functions with arguments of state that we had previously defined and the instruction itself. So using these two arguments, we could just access the fields of the state, such as register file. Uh, we can access the fields of the instruction, such as the immediate fields or like the register specifier, and actually implement the semantics. So I'm showing you add immediate here, a memory store word, and a branch equal to. So the, the, the takeaway here is that it's relatively straightforward. It's mostly pseudocode-like code here because it's all Python. So these uh, definitions uh, of encoding state and semantics feed into the Pigeon framework. Pigeon framework includes a bunch of things, such as those uh, templates you might have seen in the code, such as for register file, memory. But the most important aspect of the Pigeon framework is the interpreter loop. And you can see a simplified snippet here. Uh, it does fetch, decode, and execute as usual. So, so far, all these components I have shown is Python code, but also valid R Python code. Uh, because it is still valid Python code, you can just run this on a Python interpreter, such as CPython or PyPy. This is not very fast in performance. We typically get hundreds of 100 kips, 100,000 instructions per second. However, this is super useful if you want to use it for debugging, for instance, for assembly tests. This doesn't take too much time. However, Pigeon is def uh, designed to be used with the uh, RPython transition toolchain uh, developed by the PyPy community. And I'm showing a flow where how this flow happens. So you, at the top, you have the RPython source. So Pigeon would be this. And the tool then does type inference over this. And then it does compiler optimizations, then generates codes for C, compiles this with GCC or LLVM, depending on your platform. And now we have a native binary. Because it's native binary, and we haven't touched JIT yet, this is an uh, interpretive simulator, much faster than running on Python. Because it's native binary, we typically get 10 MIPS with this. However, the killer feature of our Python transition toolchain is this JIT generator. So um, coupled with this flow, there's a JIT generator. Basically, it couples a just-in-time compiler to the interpreter that you translated. However, if you just uh, put this uh, pigeon as is without much optimizations, this actually isn't very optimal. And you will typically see a slowdown here. So we did extensive work in adding a bunch of optimizations to get real performance with JIT enabled. You need to add a lot of, you need, you need to state all the assumptions that the JIT compiler can do to optimize your code. So here I'm just listing a bunch of optimizations we did and starting at, at, the, at the right over there, I'm starting at left on uh, gut bar is the, with no optim optimizations and adding them one by one, we could get up to 23x performance boost with this. Um, please see our ISPAS paper on the details of this. And another imp key important point is that most of these optimizations we added uh, are in the Pigeon framework alone and does not touch the ADL, the architecture and description language. So if you want to write your own new ISA, if you want to experiment with new extensions, they will uh, benefit from the, these optimizations we went through. OK, let's look at performance now. So this is running. Uh, spec int benchmarks on RISC-V port. I'm just showing you right now Pigeon without DBT, without JIT enabled. This gets around 10 MIPS here. And if we enable DBT, we typically get 100 MIPS to, in the max case, we have more than 700 MIPS here. Um, so other than the fact that DBT is much faster than um, interpretive simulator is the fact that uh, there's a big performance variation. And this is very typical of DBT-based instruction set simulators because the target code might, uh, depending on what the target code is, you, some optimizations might not be very good. As a reference point, I'm just showing you the spike uh, data points. Um, 
we are able to beat Spike by two to three X for most of the benchmarks. And another interesting point is that Spike, even though Spike is not necessarily a DBT simulator, it is actually much, much faster than Pigeon without DBT. And the reason is that Spike has a lot of optimizations, such as uh, it caches decoder instructions and it, it uses PC index dispatch to get better branch prediction for the host. So it's sort of like in between a DB and an inter interpretive simulator for that respect. So we, we do see a much faster summation time for Spike. Not only that, we also see a similar performance variation. Another important point to make here is that we are missing the bar QMU. And this is actually a testament to like lack of productivity in QMU port not being up to date. OK, let's talk about productivity now. Um, as I showed you before, RISC-V is designed with extensibility in mind for uh, domain-specific extensions for, for different users. So th these users will likely want to uh, be productively developing their instructions as simulator for new ISAs maybe, maybe um, extend this ISA for their own use for domain-specific needs and add custom uh, instrumentation so that they can assess how good or bad do these uh, specializations do. So I'll just I'll start to quantify how the uh, development works. Uh, it's just an anecdote here. So the story of us porting the Pigeon uh, RISC-V port to Pigeon was that we had a tutorial at ISCA this summer. And before the trip, uh, our advisor told us to try convince the Berkeley folks to write the uh, RISC-V port for, for Pigeon. But they ended up convincing us to do that. So this is the, just like the entire Git log of us porting this on the course of nine days. So we started uh, this during the ISCA itself. The first three days, we started hacking on the side, adding instructions here and there, uh, fixing stuff, adding floating point support, 64-bit support. At the end, the end of nine days, we managed to get 100 plus MIP simulation time running uh, spec benchmarks. So let's talk about extensibility, how we might go about this in Pigeon Framework. Uh, risc v is designed with extensibility in mind, as I told you. One of the simplest ways to extend uh, instruction support is to override the custom primary opcode. So in this case, I'm just showing a custom tool might be overridden to maybe map to a new instruction that's called a GCD for greatest common de uh, divisor. And then you can just add, implement this in just like five lines of Python code. Uh, another important thing is instrumentation. You might want to add custom instrumentation to see how productive this is. So in, in the case of add i, you might want to be just wondering how many as do I have in my program. And all you need to do is add a new field to your state that you define and increment this every time you do uh, execute function of this instruction. You might be interested in counting the number of misaligned stores you have. So it's, again, a single line of Python code. Another uh, thing you might want to do is record and count all executed loops, which will be just two lines of Python code. So why did we do, why did we do Pigeon? So it's basically for, uh, primarily, well, we designed Pigeon for our own group, uh, needs for, of our group. So examples of how we use Pigeon so far is we usually uh, want to see how um, different software phases, uh, like we want to gather statistics for different program phases. So we usually expose these phases to the Pigeon, and Pigeon can keep track of these statistics per phase. Another thing we used so far was to experiment with uh, data structure accelerators by uh, instruction set specialization. Another thing we did was uh, gather statistics for control and memory divergence for SIMD or vector machines. Uh, we, we used it for SIM point sampling. We generated basic block vectors uh, using Pigeon. And for my own personal project, I am interested in dynamic languages and how hardware can help. So I use Pigeon extensively to analyze program phases in a just-in-time enabled dynamic language interpreter here. So in, in conclusion, Pigeon is a framework written in R Python, and it is, gives you very productive architecture, architecture description language. It uses the R Python uh, framework to give you a high-performance DBT-enabled uh, instruction set simulator. It also gives you a very productive development extension and instrumentation experience. Uh, the current state is we do support uh, full 64-bit general purpose IMAFD extensions. We currently are limited to bare metal, but I'm hoping to add uh, the um, supervisor support at some point. And currently, it's on a 64-bit host only. So you can just go ahead and try use it. It's open source. It's on GitHub. Try it. Let us know what you think about it and contribute back. Thank you. Thanks. 
Thanks, Birkin. Do we have any questions for Birkin? Uh, hi, Rolf Mueller at uh, Google. A question. Uh, so if you're re-implementing the instruction sets in yet another format, uh, A, how do you verify that it matches the actual instruction set, other than just running lots of codes and looking at the answer? Have you looked at anything more formal? And B, it seems like uh, as you get to more of the corner cases, you're kind of depending on all the, uh, the way Python's going to behave with various uh, ads and some tracks. And once you start getting the floating point, you might get some funky stuff going on there. Yeah, so I think the question is that, did we formally verify this? Or, or like, what verification uh, strategy did we use? We so far used uh, the testing suite that uh, Berkeley people have distributed. So it passes all, all the tests there. Uh, I, do, I do plan to use the, the torture framework and see how, how that behaves there. I'm, I'm sure there could be some bugs, and I'm willing to fix them or uh, accept pull requests for that. Uh, the second question was, uh, uh, how does Python um, corner cases might affect here, uh, such, such as floating point. And for floating point, for instance, we used uh, uh, the soft soft float, also distributed by. Actually, it's also used by the Spike, so we, it should be compatible. So that, that's a cool feature of our Python transition toolchain because you can actually link in C, C++ based uh, libraries into your our Python development flow. So there could be other issues there, but. It's most, so far, I'm not aware of any bugs, but yeah. Hi, hey, Mark Beal from Intrinsics. I was curious about the, uh, <clears throat> whether the translation process preserves the ability to know the exact number of instructions retired. So for example, if you do this, uh, will you get the exact same number of instructions retired as if you run it through a spike simulator so that you know kind of exact performance? Yeah, so when you run it, can you determine number of extensions retired? Yes, definitely. So. Um, I did not show that code for that, but usually in the, in the state, you, we, we define the number of instructions that we actually retired or executed. So you, you can definitely do that. And you can do way more than that. You can just do any statistics you might want to do.